I pray that some kind of rationality is pervading government quarters and their advisory groups to say, you cannot just rely on the evidence of the warrior scientists. There is another thing that you have to think about, which is the future sustainability of this very precious demo demo democratic transition, very fragile one. Hello and welcome. This is Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. We have been talking a lot about South Africa, the Omicron variant. We've been doing some deep dives into the data there, but here to help us position it more in the history of that country and the particular vulnerable moment that it's in, I'm delighted to say is Brian Pottinger. He is a former editor of the South African Sunday Times and an author, and he joins us from KwaZulu-Natal. Hi, Brian. Good afternoon, Freddie. Nice to see you. So. You've been writing some wonderful pieces for us at Unheard, just giving a sense of the various sensitivities at the moment in South Africa. Let's start with this vexed question of vaccination that every country is having different responses to. But in South Africa, it's a larger issue than in some other countries because there's quite a big minority that are hesitant or not keen to take the vaccine. Tell us about the situation over there. Really, it's, it's actually it's a, it's a pretty big majority who's refusing. Uh, so far, the vaccinations uh, in some form or another is, is under 40 percent. And it's come pretty much to a screeching halt, uh, which creates a, a number of problems for the government. It's sitting with warehouses full of vaccines that are about to expire and so on and so on. So it's in a kind of if it chooses to go ahead to drive this vaccination project, it's going to have to find new ways to do it. And most of what it's been relying on now has been a sort of encouragement. We think you should do this, publicity, promotions, and so on. The discussion now is verging into something else altogether, which is compulsion through duress. Uh, and that is something which would be very familiar to a number of European countries, which are very limited access to places, depending on whether you're vaccinated or not. Now, the key concern I think a lot of people have here is that this country has a desperate history uh, in the old past, in the apartheid past, of controlling the movement of people through little pieces of paper. You can go here, you can go there. The thought of reintroducing that, even if it is to uh, advance the project of trying to vaccinate and save everybody, is anathema to a large section of the community. That's your first problem. Your second problem is enforcement. We can talk a bit later, if you want, about the operational mechanics of the way the lockdown was managed here which was appallingly, uh, but it leaves and has left a very bitter taste. So there's a great deal of skepticism about the way it's going to be implemented or even if it can be implemented. For many people, it just opens the way for yet another round of corruption uh, and, and so on. So at another level, I live in KwaZulu-Natal, a large number of the people who live around me are poor, uh, uneducated and marginalized people. When you talk to them, they see this whole thing as just a conspiracy to further repress them. Some of them, and I'm not saying this is a majority by any means, some of them are deeply superstitious people. They see it as Obutakati, they see it as witchcraft. Now to break through all of that by effectively using a very, very blunt instrument is gonna be a very, very difficult decision for the president to make. Um, it's not exactly a country that is uh, stable that has a, um, a, a sense of wide community. We've had very, very damaging riots and looting recently. I live in a village that was in the center of it. So I can speak with some authority on that. Nobody wants to go back to that. So that's the real dilemma that is confronting the, the government now. And I think a lot of us who are urging caution about this are also saying, well, just look at what we're planning to vaccinate against a virus which is proven to be quite resistant to the existing type of vaccine, so there's a problem there, but also a virus which is showing every sign of going towards expiration. We know that the pathogenic intensity is reduced. We know that the number of people who are being infected are about equal to an ordinary coronavirus. That's kind of the parameters of the debate at the moment, but it's waged, as it is all over the world, with an intenseness. How would you describe the group that is least keen on vaccines? I mean, is it, is it about poverty? Is it about region? Is it about different tribes? Or what, is the, what are the key factors in terms of understanding why different people think differently? 
it's it's pretty evenly divided, I have to say, on both sides. You getting within the sort of uh, within the online channels on on uh, of prestigious uh, business channels, you're getting a fierce debate there. You're getting a division within business organisations. One group saying we should go for these compulsory vaccinations. And another, the Afrikaans-speaking business group, Saka Licha, saying we shouldn't. You're getting a division with the trade union movement, Kusatu, a, a, a very big trade union movement, is this, trying to encourage its members to go for this and to accept the idea of vaccine passports. Another huge trade union movement, NUMSA, is saying no. So it's very widely spread. But as a general proposition, the minority communities have a higher take up of vaccination for a number of reasons, mainly because those tend to be the people in formal employment are under pressure from their employers to get vaccinated. Um, uh, what there's does a much minority lower, communities mean? Well, that would be the the the, the white community, your your uh, Indian descended, your Asiatic community, and your your mixed race community, which in South Africa is coloured. A lot of the politics in this country, despite 27 years of our of our dem democratic transition is still defined in racial terms, and that's kind of almost inevitable and to be expected. So, you know, to, to answer the question, the divisions go through the society, but the reality is that the unvaccinated are particularly in the black community. So given the obviously fraught history in South Africa, it would seem especially unwise to try to double down on these divisions and make it into something that completely defines relationships and employment and people's sort of acceptability in society. Is that what you feel? That's exactly what I feel. I think it would be a hugely unwise move. And I pray that some kind of rationality is pervading, per, pervading government quarters and their advisory groups to say, you cannot just rely on the evidence of the warrior scientists. There is another thing that you have to think about, which is the future sustainability of this very precious demo, demo, democratic transition, very fragile one. So it would be very unwise, I think, for the South African government to go this route. The difference between your country and my country, at least one of them, is that this discussion about vaccination or different attitudes to COVID, here there is such a dominance of one particular view that people who dissent from it are easily described as crazies or suspicious or you know, there's, there's no way to defend them, really. There's no cause to be sympathetic to their point of view. They are just sort of being difficult or they're troublemakers and they need to be kind of overridden with brute force. Whilst you can't make that same claim in South Africa, can you? Because the people you're describing understandably feel sceptical about government because of the history. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think you have to go back to one step back to the management of the COVID-19 uh, project itself. It, it was extremely badly managed. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, severe lockdowns were imposed very early. They were accompanied by um, bans on alcohol sales and tobacco sales because people got every everybody who had a, a particular theory got stuck in and put their claim in. Um, all that did, of course, was drive a massive um, illegal liquor trade in which, unfortunately, uh, members of the South African police were very active. Um, it, it, it was kind of a random way of, of, of implementing the system, although there were massive, massive arrests. The latest figures I have, 410,000 South Africans have been prosecuted under their regulations. Now, that is an awful lot of people out of a country of 58 million. What you're doing is you're threatening to criminalize a whole population for doing stupid things, in some cases in the early days, not being in bed by six o'clock in the evening or whatever, you know. So 410,000 so citizens were prosecuted or, or given some kind of... No, they've been arrested and, and, and they're being charged. The first wave of 300,000, those charges were quietly kind of, you know, shuffled off. The others are pending. You know, this is, this is a society which is deeply resilient. Uh, and, and often quite rebellious. I mean, our history is a history of, of conflicts, uh, conflicts which are still unresolved in many ways. Uh, and, and basically, South Africans don't like being pushed around. Uh, and they particularly don't like being pushed around if they don't understand the point of it. Now, you mentioned earlier that in Britain, there's a sort of mon the, the minority or the group that chooses to 
to raise the questions about the efficacy of all this, being treated as they kind of nuts or, or, you know, kooks or something. The same thing happens here. Uh, there is a venomous attack against anybody who chooses to challenge the orthodoxies. I wrote a book last year about it, not an anti-vax book, not a conspiracy book, not denying the need for some kind of uh, mediation of this, of this virus, not denying the severity of the virus. But it, it was amazing to see how quickly somebody like myself, who's published books and had relationships with publishers over many years, could suddenly be kind of branded oh, a kook. Um, so it happens here as well. It happens here as well. I think that the first casualty, uh, to use the cliche, the first casualty of this COVID-19 pandemic has been truth, virtually from day one. Uh, it has been appropriated, elements of truth have been appropriated for the vested interests or the political interests of parties. And it's very hard, probably we will never be able to put it together again and say what actually happened. All those certainties have now been challenged, contested, or dispelled. Mm. Uh, and, and again, out of that becomes this huge lack of confidence in what is the science actually saying? How do you follow a science when you've got uh, the scientists can't agree on it? And uh, it, goes, it goes back, doesn't it? You mentioned that early lockdown in 2020, when there was very little COVID at that point in South Africa. It had, the, there was a wave, big wave subsequently, but it hadn't happened yet. And the government reached for this very heavy-handed lockdown and I guess in townships and in communities where you know, people aren't sitting there on Zoom doing their professional job, that's not really a feasible possibility. What goes into the mind of a you know, government or a president before making that kind of decision when you'd think it was sort of common sense that that is going to cause a huge amount of hardship? I agree 100 percent, Freddie. But, but what made those decisions or what I would argue made those decisions across the developed world? Panic. Uh, it, it, you know, I would be said with studied care, but engineered panic and people just responded with panic. What happened here is because it's a coronavirus, it moves in different seasons. We, when it happened in Britain and in Europe, we were out of that season. Yet we responded and the technical advisors who went into straight panic mode for whatever reason, who reside, advised the government, then in a complete me too moment, locked us all up. By the time we'd reached the first phase of it, we'd had 103 fatalities and the nation had been locked up for five weeks. I mean, that, that is crazy. With, um, with effects, catastrophic side effects. I mean, you would With you catastrophic would economic about side effects uh, and, and, and destabilization. Uh, we know those, those political consequences for the ANC government because we had the municipal elections recently uh, um, and, and they've lost massively everywhere. And I will say with categorically that is a direct, one of the direct drivers of that loss of popularity was the attitude they took on COVID-19. People just didn't understand it. And there was even unrest, wasn't there? You were telling us about this this moment yeah. in July, what exactly happened across the country then and how related was that? Well, it wasn't related directly to COVID-19. It wasn't a protest about COVID-19. But of course, it fed into a sense of anger and rage, etc., and possibly impoverishment to an extent among the community. The drivers of that was different. That was a, a purely political fight within the ANC, within the ruling party. It was between two factions the faction led by the previous president, Jacob Zuma, who had been arrested for refusing to come to a government appointed commission of inquiry into acts of corruption, which had occurred during his tenure. He refused to come. His headquarters are at a place called Nkantla, which is just north, north of where I live. He refused to come. Eventually, he was persuaded to come. But at that point, immediately all the indications were there was going to be an insurrection among his supporters particularly in this province, in, which is the heartland of the Zulu people. And sure enough, it came in July. It had been a long time brewing ever since he lost power to Cyril Ramaphosa. We had had interdictions of roads. We'd had attacks on strategic uh, stuff. It had been a long growing insurrection, which the government had completely ignored. And then it just exploded in July with what turned out to be a very organized, very professional attack upon key installations, including ports, and including warehouses of food, shopping centers, alcohol centers. 
And that was done simply by sending out an, a WhatsApp invitation. Guys, we've just taken over this shopping center. Come down and help us. It yourself. seems relevant to observe that the situation in America in the same month was also very fraught. We're talking about July 2020. The, yes. It wasn't a you know internecine political argument between different mm. factions of a party. It was the Black Lives Matter movement and so on. But mm. the atmosphere was not dissimilar in terms of actual mm. unrest spilling out onto the streets. And that exactly. also followed very shortly after this period of lockdowns. Mm. I, I mean, I think that you can draw that you can dot, you can join the dots. I think the causality is there. You can you may debate about how much to apportion. But all of this, if you're wanting to look at the very big picture, all of this comes within the circumstances of a failing South African state. 27 years of, of African National Congress rule has done enormous damage to the country in terms of economics, economic growth, its potential, its confidence in institutions, and so on. And uh, so a lot of this is almost tail end stuff. The COVID-19 was last straw, if you want. So you think and that really COVID-19 exacerbated or accelerated a kind of disintegration that was already well underway? Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, already long before COVID-19, the state was fraying. Services were co collapsing. Uh, public protest at, at, at lack of what they call, what we call lack of service delivery was increasing dramatically. Uh, one of the surveys that I read indicated we were among the most protest prone country in the world. And this is true, virtually every day you'd wake up in some part of your immediate area, there was a problem. In. And, and that was all fundamentally because of a, of a collapse of the competence and the integrity of the institutions. Mm -hmm. And it's got to the point, recent survey done by Afrobarometer produced what I think is the most horrific thing I've ever seen where virtually 60%, well, 60% of the respondents said they would rather have this country run by a committee as long as it delivers jobs, safety, education, and health. They would rather have a committee running than the vote. So 27 years of ANC rule after all they've claimed to do and they did do to bring emancipation to South Africa, they've effectively destroyed the content of that for 60% of the people. Now that gives you an idea of the kind of backlog that now has to be made up in terms of building credibility. The rest of the world looks at South Africa as a still basically a success story. You know, we, those of us who are old enough to remember the Nelson Mandela's emergence, the um, truth and reconciliation process, the fact that there was that extraordinary transfer of power without massive bloodletting seemed to be a peaceful shift and it continued to be a successful country all that hope of those early years was that just misplaced or do you think it could have happened differently or how do you view that sweep yeah yeah it could have and 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 you know before you know i would drive everybody to 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 um sackcloth and ashes on this issue there are positives in everything. This is a very, very resilient society, resilient people. The end of it and sort of some kind of cataclysmic civil war has been predicted so many times it's impossible to say. Always the country bounces back. Uh, the transition itself, which occurred in the early 1990s, was a miracle, I believe, and it was due to very strong political leadership in the two opposing sides. Uh, it's not often that you get two intrinsically warring groups who voluntarily put everything aside under no pressure from outside. Sanctions was not a pressure. Put that aside and actually say, well, let's make it, let's do a deal here. South Africans did it. And I think South Africans should be very proud of that. I think it could have worked, but the African National Congress intrinsically was incapable of making it work. It came with too much baggage. It came with too much interest. It came with too much factionalism. It came with a lack of understanding and appreciation of the complexities of modern government. And then it just fell increasingly into a trap of, of loot and run, loot and run. And fundamentally, um, it also was pretty much guaranteed a majority at every election. Is that intrinsic to election. the corruption, do you think? Of course. Um, and that's almost the inevitable 
side effect of too much power is hubris, corruption, arrogance, and lack of consideration for the most vulnerable in your society. That's what power always does. And that's what's been happening. At one time, the ANC was able to get 72% of the popular vote. It's just scraped through at 46% at the last elections. And therein, if I do give the positive, that's the positive. The ANC is a party in decline. It is now facing bankruptcy as a party. It has to get 200 million rand between now and the end of December to pay its salaries for its staff. The organization is collapsing, let alone the institutions that it has. And what was so encouraging in the last local government elections when it came a question of coalition politics, not a single one of the major parties were prepared to deal with the ANC to allow them to keep power, except in Etiquini, which is the major town in KwaZulu-Natal, and there were different dynamics at, at play there. But basically, the ANC could find no friends prepared to help it. But this is quite an exciting thought, Brian, then. If we, if we are looking for something positive, that there's been this kind of corrupt superstructure that has not allowed the country to flourish. And maybe there are parallels with other countries in that way. And that some of this disruption, and maybe COVID is part of it, where people are just refusing to sign up to the, whatever the mainstream narrative is, will lead to a constructive breakup, a kind of, you know, creative destruction, or however we might call it. Exactly. And, you know, I, I, if I do want to take a positive out of COVID-19, although it's very hard to do so, given, you know, the, the, the extraordinary orthodox narrative that surrounded it and its dishonesty, uh, it has helped precipitate a set of circumstances where huge numbers of South Africans who would have automatically, instinctively, uh, ticky in the jukebox would have voted for the ANC, and I say, hold on, I don't think so. We're not going to do that. And the, the salvation of this country has to lie in the creation of a modernist, progressive, democratic force. It'll have to be a coalition force. That's great. We can do that. It'll have to contain a part of the ANC because that's a significant part of the national polity. That's great. We can do that. All the hope on the new president when he was elected three years ago, Cyril Ramaphosa, was he'd do precisely that. He would split the ANC, put the bad guys in prison, get rid of all that horrible baggage, take his reformist elements, ally with other reformist elements in the country, and take us forward. And that hasn't happened. And But it's now happening in another form in which the ANC, unless it's very, very careful, may not be a player at all. And I think that must be concerning people like Ramaphosa and the party strategists. They're saying there's a chance we'll be not even party, part of this game. And I'm not saying all the problems for South Africa disappear. They won't. They'll still be there. But at least we will have an element which I believe will get the support of the majority of the people here and can start tackling the core issues here. And they have to be the oldest in the world. Employment, security, stability, education, good health care. It can be done. It can be done. Money is not the issue. It is the question of the competence and the type of people who are appointed to do the jobs. So right now, we're on the verge of this decision by the government about whether they're going to try to coerce uh, people who are not taking the vaccine into doing that. Is there almost an argument that if they go down that road, it will just further speed up this disintegration and we should almost will it? Well, <laughs> I, I would prefer not to because I think the consequences of that may be even a further ratcheting up of the violent outcomes. I don't believe in revolutions. Revolutions always end up with worse outcomes. So I wouldn't want to have that. And once the revolution runs, then it consumes everybody um, on both sides. So I certainly wouldn't want that. But what I do want, or what I'd hope for, is a continuing erosion of ANC support. I'm confident they will continue to do that because they will continue governing badly. And that will just, uh, we are all now just holding breath for the next general elections, which are in two years time, which could be the decisive ones and put South Africa on a new path altogether, hopefully a path towards a remodernization. We were a comparatively modern state. We've gone through a process of demodernization. We need to stop modernizing again. If I can just leave with a last thought. Mm. Uh, when you write about these sort of things, uh, it is very easy to become trapped completely in the, pe the pessimistic paradigm. I've tried uh, in, in the last piece I wrote for you, I believe, um, I don't think it's been published yet, to try and give more of the positive to pick up on what we've been discussing. 
that out of all this tragedy and mismanagement and mischance, we may well yet be able to build the momentum for, for, for a better future. And in that sense, I have fullest confidence in the majority of South Africans. It's just that our best qualities are not being given a chance to shine because they're getting, they're getting repressed, they're getting smothered, they're getting diverted by a series of catastrophic decisions which are being made by, by political authority, driven sadly by this new class of warrior scientists. That is a new class which now, now confronts all of us across the world. It's an it's a uncontained, unelected new class um, representing various forces and interests from the purely professional through to the, the basis mercenary, and they have power and make no bones about it. That is going to be the next major conflict, in my view, in the developed world. Uh, we go beyond cultural wars now. We go into a different type of war, and that is a war between those kind of elements and the democratic institutions which represent the view of the majority of people. That's another topic altogether. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Freddie. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for inviting me. Take care. That was Brian Pottinger, former editor of the Sunday Times in South Africa, sharing his thoughts on COVID, but also how it fits into the history in that country. And I hope ended on a bit of a positive note. So thank you to him and thanks as always to you. This was Unheard.